Femoral neck fractures in patients younger than 50 years. This is from the OTA Resident Core Curriculum Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Greg Gasky. I'm Sakip Brahman narrating. And uh, in the first two videos, we already talked about anatomy classification, uh, initial treatment. We talked a lot in the last video about definitive management, surgical approaches, techniques. Um, so in this one, in the third video here, and it's the last video, we're going to finish up talking a little bit about outcomes, evidence. We're also going to go into a few uh, cases uh, in which we're going to talk about everything uh, in the last two videos and try to put it all together, and a, a little bit about special cases, um, stress fractures, for example, uh, and then we'll wrap up this slide deck. So Sliding hip screw versus cancellous screws, these are two of the mainstays of uh, fixation techniques for femoral neck fractures around the world. Um, and the FAITH trial uh, attempted to you know, look at femoral neck fractures and how should we best treat them. And uh, these were international study looking uh, at treatment of femoral neck fractures. And um, we have some conflicting evidence. I mean, it seems that sliding hip screw, hip screw devices might be better for basic cervical fractures, and that's generally how those are treated. Um, there's probably improved stability in comminuted fractures. I mean, certainly biomechanical evidence uh, has shown that uh, sliding hip screw certainly has better biomechanical stability than screws alone. Uh, but can cell screws alone are less invasive? Um, do they perhaps have improved rotational control? Um, over a sliding hip screw? Well, the FAITH-1 trial, uh, which uh, looked at uh, patients greater than 50 years old, showed um, with sliding hip screws, there was failure generally seen by screw cutout. Uh, they showed it was better for basic cervical fractures, better in smokers and displaced fractures, although overall, actually it had higher rates of osteonecrosis and more patients converted to total hips. Um, screws alone, demonstrated failure, as we saw in the last video, via varus collapse and then hardware prominence. You know, like the screws would back out significantly, also as shown in the last video, and uh, generally had a higher incidence of implant removal. Now, there have been also some retrospective studies, uh, Dr. Liparacci uh, and JBGS showing that um, uh, fixed angle devices generally had a lower rate of non-union versus cannulated screws, which had higher rate of non-unions. Um, another study, Dr. Hashino in uh, 2016, showed that um, you know fixed angle devices again had uh, failure rates, certain up to 21 percent, uh, but cancellous screws had uh, significantly uh, increased. Um, failure rate up to 60%. So the FAITH-2 um, was um, actually done a little bit differently. Um, 86 patient pilot multi-center randomized control trial looking at um, patients younger than 60, sliding hip screw versus cancellous screw, but also looking at vitamin D supplementation. So this is a sort of two by two factorial design. So this is looking a little bit more at younger patients under 60, and again, looking at uh, sliding hip screw versus cancellous screws. So one of the main things we found in this pilot study was that complication rates remain high, right? So 28% complication rate. So these are, you know, unfortunate injuries for your patients. Um, sliding hip screw and um, cancel screws alone had similar complications profiled. And what we saw in the FAITH-1, some of that was seen again here. Sliding hip screws failing via, via screw cutout and cancel screws via uh, varus collapse and hardware prominence. So similar to what we saw in the older patients uh, in the FAITH-1 trial. Um, the issue is that there's difficulty enrolling patients um, you know, demonstrating that uh, larger scale uh, trial uh, it's, it's going to be very challenging. So um, it's going to be difficult getting, you know, great answers for this, but hopeful for the future. Um, let's talk about special cases. So what about ipsilateral femoral shaft fractures? And when we talk about femoral shafts, and it's in a different lecture, 
Uh, we're going to talk about how you always want to make sure there's no femoral neck fracture. So 5 to 10% of femoral shaft fractures also have a femoral neck fracture. So it's usually the femoral shaft fracture is going to be obvious, and you have to look for the femoral neck fracture. Uh, and so in those cases, it's sometimes non-displaced, uh, but you can't miss them. Um, so you have to look at your x-rays, you have to look at CT scans, and many times these are trauma patients who already have a CT scan, and if there's a femoral shaft, you may want to consider even getting things, thin slices through the femoral neck. Uh, MRI is probably not the most practical tool um, at most centers, uh, but of course, as we mentioned earlier, they can help to demonstrate non-displaced femoral neck fractures. And, and what you saw here also was, uh, you know, a, one of the ways you can treat these, which is by retrograde intramedullary nailing and then separate screw fixation in the femoral neck. And we're not going to get too much into whether or not you use, you know, two devices or one device or you use a sliding hip screw and an uh, in intramedullary nail. I think you just keep the principles in mind that um, anatomic reduction or as, as you know, the quality of the reduction of the femoral neck is very, very important. And as we know, there are multiple ways to fix a femoral shaft fracture, um, and retrograde is perfectly acceptable. So that's a common way to do it. Um, other fixation devices. We talked a lot about sliding hip screws and cancel screws. Well, what other stuff are out there? So here you can see on the left, a blade plate. Um, this is fixed angle, so varus collapse is probably less likely. Uh, minimal risk of rotation during insertion, right? You, you're not putting this big screw and sort of rotating it as you put it in. Technically difficult to do, difficult to remove, not the most popular option. There are modern fixed angle plating systems available. So in this case, you see um, a uh, device that um, actually has a sort of a bolt here and uh, it doesn't spin as it goes in, uh, but it collapses. So it allows, it, that's supposed to be an arrow, it allows for some compression. You can see this device also has a derotation screw here. Um, and also what you can see is this has the option for locking screws here. So as the plate goes down to the shaft, it's not sort of the plate's not um, potentially affecting your reduction, right? Because it's an internal fixator. It just sits right where you put it. Uh, but this allows for some collapse. So there's a lot of thought that goes into uh, the design of some of these implants to incorporate a lot of the principles that we talked about being important uh, to allow for healing, uh, to not disrupt your um, your fixation, um, and uh, you can see some of that incorporated there. Let's let's look at a case. So here's a 21 year old with a displaced femoral neck fracture. You can see this fluoroscopic view. There's probably some traction being applied here. A little bit of joint distraction noticed. Um, so here you can see reduction. Um, there are two different clamps being shown here. There's a pointed Weber uh, forcep on the left, in the middle, and on the right you can see sort of a more of a collinear clamp. And then you can see placement of um, provisional pins to maintain the reduction. And then you can see uh, this case uh, that was shown in the previous uh, x-ray where you have this uh, femoral neck fixation device where um, there's a, it looks like a locking screw but, and a cortical screw here. Um, and you certainly have the option to just do locking screws, and you can see this sort of collapsible device uh, with the separate derotational screw here. So this is just an early follow-up of, again, these are cases that can take a very long time uh, to, you know, to heal and need close follow-up over many months. Now, we didn't really talk a lot about this at all in this femoral neck fracture slide uh, slide deck, but of course, arthroplasty should be considered in patients with advanced age or non-reconstructable, highly comminuted femoral neck fractures. Um, sometimes, you know, these are just not going to work out with internal fixation. And as we know, in elderly patients, a displaced femoral neck fracture is best treated with arthroplasty. Uh, there are higher risks of reoperation um, when you... Uh, when you operate on some of these patients, so you should keep that in mind as well. What about the question of capsulotomy? So 
I don't think we've really come up with a definitive answer to this, but the concept is that if you have an intraarticular fracture, like a femoral neck fracture, there's going to be fracture hematoma, and does the sort of pressure from the hematoma cause ischemia, you know, by pressure on the uh, on the vessels to the to the femoral head. Uh, and the thought is that if you do an intentional capsulotomy, and here you can see there's a in the image is a there's a ten blade it looks like a, you know basically cutting down on the on the capsule. Does that relieve intraarticular pressure? Not really sure. I mean, um, there's studies that have looked at it. Is it clinically relevant? Not sure. Uh, here's an older study. Um, showing that uh, maybe it's not associated with the osteonecrosis. So I don't think we really have an answer to that. Uh, should you do it? Should you not do it? I don't know. Uh, what about stress fractures? So just keep in mind, in general, stress fractures are usually from abnormal increased stresses on normal bone, or sometimes it could be from normal stresses on abnormal bone. Um, but typically, there's insidious onset of pain. It's not like they suddenly just get the pain out of nowhere. Um, this can often be due to repetitive loading of the femoral neck. So somebody you know, it could be a younger, healthy patient who suddenly is thrown into a situation where they're maybe carrying a pack and marching long distances. Uh, so it's sometimes seen in military recruits. Um, it can be seen in athletes. So you have to have a high index of suspicion, X-ray, CT, you know, even MRI. Um, to evaluate and make sure you don't miss this. What you don't want to end up with is a femoral neck fracture going on to displace like that and then ending up in a situation that you have to employ all the principles we've talked about in this lecture. So there are two, a couple of things to think about. There, there's um, stress fractures that develop on the compression side, um, and then there's... Um, fractures that occur on the tension side. So um, on the compression side, there's some thought that you can perhaps watch these. So let's say you have an, you know, just a small stress fracture developing. It's incomplete on the compression side over here where the blue lines are. Well, you may be able to treat that with limited weight bearing, very close follow-up. Uh, if you're really nervous and you just want to put it to rest, you can do cancella screws. Um, if it's a complete fracture through the compression side, you certainly want to fix those. Uh, and any kind of tension-sided femoral neck fracture, it, the, the concern is more risk for displacement, and you really shouldn't uh, mess around with those and just go ahead and, and, and fix them. What about rehab? So uh, you're not going to necessarily immobilize them, right? You're not going to put an abduction pillow or brace or anything like that. Uh, but you will limit weight bearing, you know, non weight bearing or, you know, something with very minimal weight bearing, toe touch, true foot flat weight bearing. But, you know, to be safe, you could just say non weight bearing. And this way, it kind of puts that question to rest about how much weight the patient's really putting on it. So you really don't want to do normal weight bearing on this initially. Um, for the young patient with a femoral neck fracture that was displaced that you had to fix. Uh, but then you can gradually progress weight bearing at two to three months. So we talked about this a lot. Shortening is very common. And I would even go as far as to say is that if you put a fixation device that allows no shortening at all, like you just straight up fix your device with a locked plate uh, with all locking screws, including into the femoral head, you're probably not going to heal. Um, but excessive shortening is not good, um, and that, that can lead to, 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 to complications and problems and um, abductor weakness. Uh, osteonecrosis, of course, is a, is a risk. Non-union is a risk. Uh, and then, of course, infection, hardware failures. And these, you know, the reoperation rate is not insubstantial. We talked about this in uh, the earlier uh, part of this video. Um, and uh, so these are unfortunate cases for your patients because complications are very high. If things don't work out, if you have a non-union, um, you have to make a decision. Is this a patient that requires revision, operation, uh, total hip arthroplasty? Uh, in many cases, that may be the case. Um, there are some patients that may benefit from a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy. Uh, 
And in these cases, what you're trying to do is you're trying to non-anatomically, uh, to some extent, c convert you know those sort of vertical shear forces uh, to compressive forces. So you sort of, maybe I'll draw this a little bit more. You know, so let's say if your fracture line was like this, you want to sort of turn it into a fracture line that's a little bit more like this, right? So. What that does is improves your chance for healing of the fracture. And you can see what's been done is they've taken the fracture that was in varus and put it into significant valgus. Uh, and that, by definition, will tilt that fracture line into a position of more, which will allow for more compression and uh, improve your chance for, for healing. So here's an example of that. Again, if you're in OTA member, go to otaonline.org, or if you're not a member, um, become one, and uh, you can have access to some really high-quality videos, including how to do an intertrochanteric osteotomy. So, in summary, femoral neck fractures in uh, younger patients uh, under 50 years old. Choice of approach is based, to some extent, on fracture pattern and location, and surgeon preference, to some extent. We talked about that uh, earlier. Anatomic reduction is critical. Um, you really want to get cortical contact. Uh, ideally, fix these within 24 hours, uh, although the correlation with osteonecrosis is somewhat controversial. So um, timing is important, but not as important as accuracy of reduction. Same thing with open versus closed. The sort of dogma about you have to open all of these may not really be uh, true, um, and what is more important, again, is accuracy reduction. Fixation devices, we have conflicting evidence, um, uh, unclear, um, and we have some newer devices now um, that uh, we talked about a little bit as well. Um, so I don't think we can definitively say one device is absolutely better than another, um, but there's some reasons to use one versus the other. Uh, and you you know, complication rates are high, right? So counsel your patients early regarding the significant risk of complications and reoperation. I mean, you don't want to necessarily just uh, kind of get them down right from the start and say this is terrible and, you know, you're, you're going to have complications. But you do have to be a little bit realistic about what you're dealing with and let them know that, um, uh, that unfortunately, you know, these will require a lot of attention, a lot of care. Um, you really have to pay attention to, you know, technique. You have to pay attention to the weight-bearing restrictions post-op. You have to pay attention to, you know, early and frequent follow-up. Uh, and these are not uh, injuries you can just follow casually. Here are some important references. And uh, thank you very much. That's the end of this slide lecture.